Hello everyone, my name is John Sierra and I'm a Tolkien scholar, which means that I am always learning about, reading about, and teaching about the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, and I'm here to answer your questions, which of course are submitted through Quora every week, and if you go to the link in the description, there is a link to my Quora account, so if you have any question that you would like to be answered in a video, you can do it through there. It's very easy to make a core account if you don't already, and you can use existing uh, accounts from Google or Facebook. Anyway, we have quite a lot to get through 18 questions this week, but of course I want to do a, a reading for you, and we're going to be reading from The Fellowship of the Ring today, I don't, which I don't have open to the correct part. But what I wanted to read from was... Um... Oh, here we are. The section where the hobbits first meet, well, they have they have just recently met Strider, who of course we know as Aragorn, and they have been uh, taken into a room, and they don't know if they trust this man or not, and we're going to read the part that includes Gandalf's letter. Here we are. Well, said Strider, when are you going to open that letter? Frodo looked carefully at the seal before he broke it. It seemed certainly to be Gandalf's. Inside, written in the wizard's strong but graceful script, was the following message. The Prancing Prony, Bree, Mid-Year's Day, Shire Year, 1418. Dear Frodo, bad news has reached me here. I must go off at once. You had better leave Bag End soon and get out of the Shire before the end of July at latest. I will return as soon as I can, and I will follow you if I find that you are gone. Leave a message for me here if you pass through Bree. You can trust the landlord, Butterbur. You may meet a friend of mine on the road, a man, lean, tall, dark, by some called Strider. He knows our business and will help you. Make for Rivendell. There I hope we may meet again. If I do not come, Elrond will advise you. Yours in haste, Gandalf. P.S. Do not use it again, not for any reason whatever. Do not travel by night. P.P.S. Make sure that it is the real Strider. There are many strange men on the roads. His true name is Aragorn. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old thing is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall the blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. P. 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 S. I hope Butterbur sends this promptly. A worthy man, but his memory is like a lumber room. Thing wanted, always buried. He forgets. I shall roast him. Farewell. Frodo read the letter to himself, and then passed it to Pippin and Sam. Really, old Butterbur has made a mess of things, he said. He deserves roasting. If I had got this at once, we might have been safe in Rivendell by now. But what can have happened to Gandalf? He writes as if he was going into great danger. He has been doing that for many years, said Strider. Frodo turned and looked at him thoughtfully, wondering about Gandalf's second postscript. Why didn't you tell me that you were Gandalf's friend at once, he asked. It would have saved time. Would it? Would any of you have believed me till now, said Strider. I knew nothing of this letter. For all I knew, I had to persuade you to trust me without proofs, if I was to help you. In any case, I did not intend to tell you all about myself at once. I had to study you first and make sure of you. The enemy has set traps for me before now. As soon as I had made up my mind, I was ready to tell you whatever you asked. But I must admit, he added with a queer laugh, that I hoped you would take me for my own sake. A hunted man sometimes wearies of distrust and longs for friendship. But there I believe my looks are against me. They are, at first sight at any rate, laughed Pippin with sudden relief after g reading Gandalf's letter. But handsome is as handsome does, as we say in the Shire, and I dare say we shall all look much the same after lying for days in hedges and ditches. It would take more than a few days or weeks or years of wandering in the wild to make you look like Strider, he answered. And you would die first unless you were made of sterner stuff than you looked to be. Pippin su subsided. But Sam was not daunted, and he still eyed Strider dubiously. How do we know you're the real Strider that Gandalf speaks about, he demanded. You never mentioned Gandalf till this letter came. You might be a play-acting spy, for all I can see, trying to get us to go with you. 
you might have done in the real Strider and took his clothes. What have you to say to that? That you are a stout fellow, answered Strider. But I am afraid my only answer to you, Sam Gamgee, is this. If I had killed the real Strider, I could kill you. And I should have killed you already without so much talk. If I was after the ring, I would have it now. He stood up and seemed suddenly to grow taller. In his eyes gleamed a light, keen and commanding. Throwing back his cloak, he laid his hand on the hilt of a sword that had hung concealed by his side. They did not dare to move. Sam sat wide-mouthed, staring at him dumbly. But I am the real strider, fortunately, he said, looking down at them with his face softened by a sudden smile. I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and if by life or death I can save you, I will. Exciting stuff, no? I hope you enjoy that. We're going to jump into the questions now. Okay, so we're going to start with a, a question. This was submitted anonymously, and it's about Tom Bombadil, which is a, always a favorite a favorite uh, discussion amongst to Tolkien scholars. And I, I feel I was just speaking uh, to another Tolkien scholar earlier today, and I said that um, trying to understand uh, Bombadil is is folly it's you're missing the point but i understand the curiosity though to, to want to know more about him so uh this person asks what would tom bombadil do if smaug the dragon invaded his forest and attacked his lands well you know tom bombadil as i already alluded to is one of the most mysterious characters in the lord of the rings but it it's fairly obvious what he would do if Smaug or, or any other dragon suddenly showed up in his domain in the old forest. Uh, he would do what he always does. He'd sing a song. His, uh, the lyric would describe who he is, who his wife is, and of course that he's merry. And the color of his jacket and his boots, uh, a lot of ring-a-ding, dillo, ding-a-ding, tom-tom sort of stuff. And then, and then he would launch into a second verse, asking Smaug, or, or whatever the dragon may be, to leave and never return. And Smaug would be about halfway home, and then suddenly he'd say, wait, what just happened? You know, so uh, Tom Bombadil is, is sort of the supreme being in his own small domain i do you really can't overcome him and he he always sort of reacts in that same way singing a song and and then everything turns out just great all right next question also came in anonymously why did J.R.R. tolkien relegate the romance between aragorn and arwen to the appendices of the return of the king this is something that i think can be especially jarring for people who saw the films first and then go to read the books to find that Arwen is much less of a character in the book and there's no real grand romance between Aragorn and Arwen until you get to the appendix and you read the tale of Aragorn and Arwen and you learn of their past and then suddenly you understand them and you understand why he chose her over say you know Eowyn or any number of women that he might have uh married um in the actual text, there's not a lot of Arwen, and it's because Arwen was sort of a late addition to the story. Um, the original plan that Tolkien had was that Aragorn would wed a character called Eowyn, um, and the character of Eowyn was interesting because the, the Eowyn that we know now in The Lord of the Rings is put together from two different characters, one of which was Eowyn, Theoden's niece, Eomir's sister, and then there was another character named Edis, who was Theoden's daughter. And Tolkien eventually felt that Edis was superfluous. She wasn't needed. She didn't add much to the story. So he basically erased her from the canon and gave some of her traits to Eowyn. Um, however, when Tolkien made the decision to connect everything, to make The Lord of the Rings part of his greater work his legendarium and not just the sequel to the hobbit um and therefore it was now connected to the silmarillion and it was connected to one of the major stories from the silmarillion what tolkien would call his chief story his most important story beren and luthien and at, he wanted to play up the similarities between aragorn and beren and to do this he needed a character that 
as Aragorn is sort of a stand-in for Beren in the Third Age, a character that would be a stand-in for Luthien, which became Arwen. Obviously, the story of Aragorn and Arwen is very different from the story of Beren and Luthien, but there is enough similarities uh, that it, it references that. Another big reason, though, is that Arwen doesn't join the quest. She's not there for a lot of the books, so other than inserting a very long flashback into the center of the narrative where Aragorn might just uh, sit and tell a story, um, there's not really much reason to include it in the main text. It, it happened, it all of everything between them happened in the interim between The Hobbit and, and The Lord of the Rings, and it wouldn't need to be reflected on. Aragorn does speak of it in clandestine ways, uh, he tells the hobbits of Beren and Luthien, and, and when Frodo meets Arwen, he understands why the story of uh, Luthien Tenuviel means so much to Aragorn. A final reason, though, is that in universe, uh, the Lord of the Rings is written by the hobbits, Frodo and Samwise chiefly. The, there's accounts from, from Merry and Pippin, and it's supplemented by the observations of the wise. The tale of Aragorn and Arwen was written later, by um, Faramir's grandson, um, Baurahir of Ithilien. So that was added to the, uh, the version of the Red Book called the Thane's Copy. So as such, it is an appendix to the Lord of the Rings. Okay, next question. This one came in uh, from somebody whose name on core is Learner Learner. So I guess they're very interested in learning about things. And they asked me, what is the test that Galadriel passed when Frodo offered the One Ring? So this is a, one of my favorite dis, uh, discussions to have about the Lord of the Rings is Galadriel passing the test. And what is that test? When the Fellowship came to Lothlorien, Galadriel tested their hearts. But in offering the ring to Galadriel, Frodo unwittingly tested her heart. Galadriel was greatly concerned with the welfare of her own realm, Lothlorien, and she has not been above using magical implements to preserve it. The Elisar is one such example, at least in uh, certain versions of the story. The most accepted version of the story of the Elisar is that um, it was brought back over the sea by Gandalf. It was made by Celebrimbor. He gave it to Yarendil. Yarendil brought it into the uttermost west, and then when Gandalf arrived, he had the Elisar with him, and he gave it to Galadriel. There's a little bit more of a chain of um, custody beyond that, because Galadriel gave it to her daughter, Calabrian, and Calabrian gave it to her daughter, Arwen, and then Arwen, at one point, gives it back to Galadriel, and then Galadriel gives the Elisar to... Um, to to Aragorn. Um, and then there's another version of the story where Gandalf did not bring back the Elisar, but Celebrimbor made another Elisar, a copy of it, and he gave this one to Galadriel specifically so that she could preserve her realm. Whereas in the other version, Gandalf was giving it to her not to preserve her realm, but to give it to the man who will be king. Either way, the Elisar is, is a healing gem, and it has healing and preservation in mind, and Galadriel used it to preserve her realm for when she had it. And the same thing can be said for her ring of power, Nenya. So in understanding this, we can establish Galadriel is, is accustomed to using magical implements to keep Lothlorien pure and untouched by evil. Now, the most powerful magical object in Middle Earth, at least in the in the Third Age, is the One Ring, and it has been known to tempt people to seize it, particularly people who are used to wielding power. Galadriel is one of those people. She's used to wielding power. She puts herself in quite the lofty perch, where she declares herself to be the judge of worthiness of the Fellowship of the Ring. She's going to test them as they come through and make sure that they are worthy. And it, it kind of comes off a certain way. Every member has already been vetted by Lord Elrond, but Galadriel is sort of looking for a weak point. She's looking for an excuse, if you may, to say, 
Frodo is unworthy or or there is a, the fellowship is unworthy and then she can take the one ring so she's testing his heart now from Frodo's perspective he's faced with a being of pure goodness wisdom beauty and he does what Frodo has done up until this point he offers her the ring he offered it to, to Aragorn, he offered it to Gandalf, he offered it to Elrond, and now he's offering it to Galadriel. And he just he just says, I will give you the ring if you ask for it. Uh, because he's thinking, wow, she's the most wonderful person. She's, she's the uh, paragon of good. It, it would be much better off with her than it is with me. And in this way, Frodo has completely passed the test because he doesn't really want the ring. He doesn't desire the ring. He doesn't desire to use its powers. He's trying to be rid of it. He wants to destroy it. Whereas Galadriel, for her part, wants the ring. Because she... Well, let, let's back up a bit. Galadriel came to Middle-earth for a specific reason, to found and rule a fair kingdom. And in founding Lothlorien, she has succeeded in that goal, but how far is she willing to go to keep it? If Frodo succeeds and he destroys the One Ring, um, and it was mentioned by Elrond, and it was mentioned by Galadriel, that there are those who would hope that the Three Rings would be freed of the influence of the One Ring and they would retain their power, but Elrond believed, and Galadriel also believed, that that is not the case, that they will lose their power because they were bound to the One Ring you know, one ring to find them. So she fears that her own ring is going to lose its power. And this is going, and she was correct. And this is going to weaken her realm. It's going to open it to decay. It's going to open it to the ravages of time. And it's going to open it to evil. Even with Sauron gone, there would be petty evils that could penetrate her borders, not to mention the loss of preservation of the realm that she has enjoyed for so long. If Frodo fails, Sauron regains the One Ring, and now she can't use Nenya any longer. It's no longer safe. She would become bound to Sauron. She would become a wraith. So she would have to forsake the Ring, and that also would weaken her realm, which would be now an open target for Sauron's forces. So here's the temptation. Galadriel believes, however briefly and however falsely, that she find, if she can find a reason to declare Frodo as unworthy to be the ring bearer, that she can take the ring from him, use it to defeat Sauron, and preserve Lothlorien forevermore. But by offering her the ring, Frodo has basically, not only has he passed her test with flying colors, but he's played the Uno reverse card, the biggest Uno reverse card ever. And she finds that now it's her heart that is being tested. In this moment, she is faced with the humility and earnestness of Frodo. She believes that even of her vision that, that, that was given by the One Ring, and we know the One Ring is evil and the One Ring is deceptive and that it's not going to give her the power to overthrow Sauron. Why would it overthrow Sauron? It is, it is Sauron. Um, she would become like Sauron in that case, there is a running theme in Tolkien's work. It's sort of the the most important morality lesson that one could take from the Lord of the Rings, although it is not an allegory, it is didactic. It is attempting to impart a moral lesson that you cannot use evil means to do good deeds. Um, and it doesn't get much more evil than the One Ring, because the One Ring is a part of Sauron. It's a, it's a great part of Sauron, at, um, at least not in the Third Age, because Morgoth's not around. Galadriel was proud, but she was also very wise, and she realized in attempting to test Frodo, he has tested her, and by rejecting the power of the One Ring, uh, or at least the power that she believes the One Ring will give her, um, she has accepted the end of Lothlorien. She has accepted that her realm has come to an end. She has passed the test and she has earned her path back into the uttermost west. At the end of the first stage, after the War of Wrath, all, virtually all of the Noldor exiles were forgiven and pardoned and allowed to return to, to Aman, to the Undying Lands. And some of them chose to live in Tal Erisea for whatever reasons that they had, but they were welcome back. There was no... Um, there was no sort of um, 
probation involved in that. But there were specific elves, uh, and the only named one was Galadriel, that were the leaders of rebellion. They were the agitators. You could you could say that Maglor was, was likely another one that was named. But Galadriel was named that she was not allowed back. And at that point, she didn't want to come back. She had no interest in coming back. So if she had a sin that the, the Valar were looking for her to to cop to, to confess to, it would be her pride. She had to prove that she would not seize power to maintain her realm and become like Sauron had become. Excellent question, though. Okay, the next question comes in from Jack Mann, who asks, uh, this is an interesting one. I never really gave this much thought, but was the destruction of Numenor felt in Middle Earth, and I have to say yes. I, as a matter of fact, I would say that it was likely felt throughout the entirety of Arda. The Akalabeth was not just the sinking of of an island nation like Numenor, but the breaking of the world by Iluvatar. The changing of the world wasn't just one event, but a sequence: the War of the Valar moving on through the the War of Wrath and the sinking of Beleriand, and finally through to the Akalabeth and the breaking of the world. So the Akalabeth broke the world and made it round, where it was previously flat. I can't say precisely what this felt like in Middle-earth, but at the very least we can imagine a, a great shaking of the earth. The destruction was not limited strictly to Numenor. Numenor was not the only place that was destroyed in the Akalabeth, but there were places in Middle-earth that were affected. This is why Quivienian, which was the ancestral uh, birthing place or awakening place of the original elves, no longer exists in the Second and Third Ages. It's just not there anymore because when you take the flat earth and you break it and you make it round, there has to be changes. It can't be the same map just stretched into a ball. So um, that's where you get things like Quivien and being gone. The alterations have to happen, and that absolutely, uh, there would have been an effect of that. And um, even though I said that I never really gave much thought as to uh, the, you know, people in Middle Earth feeling the Akalabeth, somebody in the comments, uh, let me see if I can find it, posted a uh, a quote, which I'm not seeing now. Well, perhaps I, I can't find it. Oh, well, they posted a quote that that showed that there were rivers were changed and mountains fell and such. And this happened in Middle Earth. So, yeah, it was definitely felt 100 percent. OK, next one. Uh, this one came in from uh, C. Felipe Medeiros, who asks, in Middle Earth, did people know that Gandalf was I immortal or celestial? He he wandered far and wide and he was known by many names. He talked to kings and queens and people must have noticed this non-elf hanging around forever so yeah it is entirely possible that most men actually thought that gandalf was an elf um and that most elves probably knew the truth or at least guessed the truth but they kept it to themselves um gandalf was in disguise and, and they, they had to realize that it was before a good reason so nobody was about to blow his cover in that sense gandalf never presented himself um, un until he returned as Gandalf the White, at least, as anything more than what he appeared to be, an old pilgrim who brings wisdom and counsel and entertains people with magic, the elves would figure that he was from the West, just because, like you said, he's been around for a really long time. If he arrived in 1000 of the, uh, the Third Age, by the time the Lord of the Rings has come, it's over 2000 years later, so he's been around for a very long time. The elves would have to figure this out. Um, now, Círdan is the one guy that we know knows the true identity of all the wizards because he witnessed their arrival. They came over the sea in ships and they landed at Mithlond and he witnessed this. And uh, it was said that he shared this information with Lord Elrond and he shared this information with Galadriel. And from this, we can surmise that Ar Arwen probably knows and Celeborn probably knows and maybe Haldir knows. Who knows how many elves know or have just figured it out on their own? Uh, Glorfindel would certainly know because he is on a similar mission from Manwe, and he might have even arrived with some of the wizards, the, the blue wizards. Now, as for men, well, here's the thing. They don't live that long. So when Gandalf has appeared a thousand years ago, 
it was a completely different set of, of human beings. They're not there anymore. Um, but there's still reason to believe that they thought Gandalf was an elf. Uh, for one, although he does appear old, he has a beard, he, he's got gray hair, he's, he's wizened, he leans on a staff. Um, Kyrdin is old and has wrinkles and gray hair and a beard. So it's possible that men would assume that Gandalf is an elf that is similarly ancient to as Círdan is. Um, but the key to this, though, is the name. Uh, Gandalf took a lot of names. His name is Aloran. That's his true name. But the name Gandalf, which was given to him by the men of the north, it means elf of the cane. So it's possible that they did assume he was an elf, or at least elf-like. Um, now, it should be mentioned, though, that there is the possibility that some people thought Gandalf was what we would call a, a sorcerer, um, a, a human a mortal who has artificially lengthened his lifespan using magic. Uh, there were men that were known to do this, the mouth of Sauron, uh, the, the men that would eventually become the ring wraiths. They were using magic means, uh, notably the rings of power. So it's possible that some people um, made that assumption. It does, of course, doesn't mean it's true. But the fact is that the fact that they named him Gandalf, which does mean elf of the cane, hints towards, at the very least, that they believed that he was an elf. Okay, and we have another Gandalf-related question that came in from Gwyndin Ma uh, Madalk Williams. I hope I said that right. In Tolkien's mythology, is it ever mentioned whether uh, Maya need to sleep gandalf sleeps but he's commanded to operate as if he were a mortal um so i don't believe that they generally need to sleep but it is mentioned that the einar will rest at times uh including even the valar particularly after great labors uh, gandalf's case is a bit different though he's not just operating as if he were mortal he's incarnated which means given flesh under normal circumstances, uh, the Ainur are invisible to the children of Iluvatar, they're spirits, and the, but they can give themselves forms, bodies, in quotes, bodies, to give themselves shape and hue so that they could be seen by the children of Iluvatar. Uh, these bodies are raiment, meaning it's like a suit of clothes that the spirit is wearing. But Gandalf is incarnated, he's given flesh, meaning that his spirit is not just wearing a form that he could cast aside and go in his naked spirit form, but he is bound to a real living, breathing body. This means that Gandalf does have all the same needs that anyone else might have for, for food, for shelter, for water, for rest. So Gandalf isn't sleeping just to appear as a mortal, but he has to sleep. Okay, next question. This one came in anonymously. Uh, where exactly do hobbits get tea from? Do they get it from Far Harad or the lands beyond Harad? For that matter, does tobacco come from Numenor? Uh, potatoes were already in Beleriand. Is there perhaps an India or a China in the east? Um, well, Middle, Middle Earth as a whole, we, we only really concern ourselves with the, the northern, the northwesternmost bit of it, but uh, Middle Earth is analogous to Europe, Africa, and Asia, but it's a fantasy realm. It's not actually Europe, Africa, and Asia. One's mind need not boggle at why Bilbo has tea, because you say, well, tea comes from China, uh, and we don't need to wonder why he has potatoes, which come from Peru. Um and they would not be native to the English land of the Shire. It's a fantasy land. And while we can say that the Shire becomes England and Gondor becomes Italy and all that, it's after the world is changed by the second music. In early drafts of The Hobbit, Bilbo actually mentioned China, which it just became an Eastern land in the published version. There certainly are analogs, but that's not necessarily where tea came from. Just because tea came from China in the real world doesn't mean that tea came from this Eastern land in, in the Legendarium. Uh, now, Tolkien did remove a mention of tomatoes from an earlier draft, but he kept potatoes in due to the fact that he wanted the culture of the Shire to be rural British as the author understood it. 
not out of a historical or even a semi-historical context, potatoes were deemed to be too important to Tolkien's view of rural English food culture to not be included in this work, where the Shire is not literally England, but represents England, an idealized, fanta- fantastical version of England. Uh, pipeweed, similarly, uh, it is absolutely from Numenor, um, though it was never used for smoking. Uh, it was it was brought from Numenor. They called it Westman's weed, but it wasn't until hobbits got their hands on it that um, it was used for smoking. So I'm not actually sure. It's not actually mentioned what they used the, the pipeweed uh, for before that. Of course, they didn't call it pipeweed. They call it Westman's weed. Um, and we're not sure why they brought it over from Numenor, but they did. It might have been just colonization, just uh, bringing something from home so to make their uh, new home familiar to them. And it, it, they may have used it for something that may have had some sort of medicinal value, but the hobbits were the ones that figured out to smoke it. Okay, next question is an anonymous one. What made the orcs afraid of Sheila? This is a really easy one. Uh, she ate them. That's, that's real simple. Um, Sauron liked to think of Sheila as his cat. Uh, obviously, she's not a cat, but that was sort of the, the thought that he had. He, she guards the pass of Kirith Ungol, and he could feed her prisoners that he has no more use for by driving them into his, into her lair. Sheila, though, for her part, she has no particularly loyalty to Sauron. She may not even really care about him at all, wh- whether he's there or not, um, or even be aware that he's the one that's that's forcing people into her lair. Sheila eats whatever prey she can get. She doesn't discriminate between good and evil. She discriminates between food and not food. Orcs are afraid of her because they're food to her. Um, at one point, for whatever reason, we're not exactly sure she deemed Gollum to be not food, but that is basically all it is, is um, food and not food. It is possible that she did view Gollum as food, but that he convinced her that he could bring her uh, better food. And I always like to think, and I don't like to use the term head cannon, but it has been my thought that Gollum he, he did not like the taste of orcs and probably saw that Shelob had been mostly eating orcs and uh, they, they might have bonded over, well, they don't taste very good, so I'll bring you something better. Okay, next question. This is a really simple one that came in anonymously. Do we know what Pippin and Merry were doing while Frodo and Sam were on Mount Doom. Uh, yeah, of course we know. Um, Mary was actually in Gondor uh, in the hospital. Uh, they call it the, the Houses of Healing, but it's easy to understand that it is a, it is a hospital. And he'd been wounded, spiritually wounded at that, by the Witch King, um, as had Eowyn. Um, and he was recuperating with Eowyn, and Faramir was there as well. Uh, so Mary set out the final battle. He was recuperating from his wounds that he got at Pelennor Fields. Uh, Pippin was at Moranon, which is the Black Gate, and he was fighting alongside Aragorn and Gandalf and Imrahil and everybody else. He actually managed to kill an Olag Hai, uh, which is a, a large war troll, and it fell on him, kind of squished him. Before he passed out, he noted that the eagles had arrived. Thankfully for Pippin, uh, Gimli saw the, uh, the, the troll land on him and, and uh, rescued him. Okay, next question. Uh, this is another anonymous one. How much money did the hobbits have at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings? Um, now, assuming you don't mean their net worth, but how much money they brought with them on their journeys. And, and Tolkien doesn't actually go into specifics about how much money they were carrying, but it, it was enough for their purposes. Uh, and after they passed through Bree, they really there, there were no purposes for money. They didn't need money after that. So Frodo... And Merry and Pippin, they're, they're all wealthy. They have a lot of money. But it was mentioned that Frodo had left in a, in a pretty big hurry, a much, much more of a hurry than he had anticipated, so he didn't have a lot of cash on hand. Um, they all had enough to pay for everything that they needed at the Prancing Pony, and we can assume that Samwise must have had cash on hand because uh, he had wished to go to buy water and visit the, the Green Dragon and, and drink a lot of beer there. Um, the currency in Arthedyne, uh, which is the region of Arnor that uh, contains the Shire and Breeland, it was silver pennies. And of course, Frodo and Bilbo had gold, uh, but we can assume that there was a, an exchange rate for silver pennies for gold ones, and or, or, or perhaps uh, if you had gold, they would just bring out a scale. Frodo did have silver pennies, though. Bill the Pony cost uh, 12 silver pennies, which um, was expensive. 
it was more than build a pony was worth it it was mentioned that uh, a, a pony should cost four silver pennies but uh, bill fernie who owned the the animal uh was price gouging now frodo was worried because um he wasn't sure that he had enough money but um mary could have covered it pippin could have covered it um but in this case the cost was actually covered by barlam and butterbur who was offended at the price gouging and he felt guilty about the fact that they they had ponies and that the ponies had run off while they were at his care of course that was not his fault it was the nazgul's fault but he they were in his care and they had run off and he had actually given uh mary extra money as recompense for that loss so it's possible that mary might have left the prancing pony with more money than he had uh going into it either way whatever money they had doesn't come into play after brie um they went into the wild and then when they stayed in civilized areas they were as honored guests and they did not need to pay anybody any sort of money and the next mention of money was much much later when bilbo gives sam some money at the end of the story we don't know exactly how much but it was enough okay next question uh what is the most po- this is the one from the, the 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 thumbnail what is the most powerful sword in the history of middle earth um that would have to be anglachel which was reforged and renamed as girthang so it was forged by a guy named Eol, who was called the dark elf and uh he he was called the dark elf just because he hated the sunlight and he only liked to operate at night um, and he used black ore that came from a meteorite. Anglachel, which means Iron of the Flaming Star, was a mighty sword with an eerie otherworldly power, and it contained malice that Aeol himself put into it. Though I postulate that it's possible that because the, me- the, uh, the metal came from a meteorite, it may have been imbued with an evil spirit from the void. Now, the sword was said to be jet black, but it glowed with an inner fire and could handily slice through iron with very little effort. Aeol lived in the forest away from Doriath, and because this was sort of unusual, he paid tribute to the king of Doriath, uh, Thingol, and he gave Anglachal and several other uh, crafts to Thingol. Now, Ang- um, Thingol did not use the sword. Uh, his wife, Melian, who was an, was an Ainu spirit, she recognized that there was some sort of dark presence in the blade, and she warned him against using it. So it stayed in the treasury. Uh, Beleg was another elf, and he took Anglachel from the treasury when he was told that he could just take any weapon, and he just grabbed that one. He wound up being accidentally slain by Turin, and then Turin took the sword. So Turin later had the blade reforged in Nagarthrond. And he renamed it Gurthang, which means Iron of Death. It was still black. It still glowed. And it was still considered to be malevolent. In the hands of Turin, Gurthang became a very feared weapon by the forces of Morgoth, particularly the orcs. And Turin was a warrior that was seen as almost mythological even in his time to the point where one of the names that he was given, and he was given a lot of names, was Mormigal, which means black sword. Turin used the blade to kill a dragon, Glaurong, uh, which was the first and, and possibly the greatest of the dragons before the winged dragons came about at least. And he ended his own life with the sword, um after finding out that the woman he had married was actually his sister, and that's a long story. But he was filled with despair for his own actions and, and the bad life that he had led because he was, he unknowing to him, he was cursed by Morgoth. So before he died, the sword spoke to him, and it, which proves that it was somewhat alive. The sword, uh, broke when Turin died and it was buried with him in a grave simply marked the children of Hurin and um which was also a grave marker for his sister though her body was never recovered his mother was later also buried there and the grave site became known as the stone of the hapless so in the final battle in Degor Degoroth Turin and Gurthang are said to return and he will use the sword to slay Morgoth making it a sword that is capable of killing one of the Valar. While it would have to be yet again reforged, because it was broken, uh, 
it's unknown if the sword just had that ability to kill Morgoth all along, or if it would have to be blessed by Iluvatar for this to happen, but either way, it is the only weapon in Tolkien's work mentioned to be able to kill one of the Valar, so it has to be an easy answer to the, the greatest sword in the history of Middle-earth. Okay, next question. Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, how well were Frodo and Sam portrayed in Peter Jackson's uh, The Lord of the Rings movies? So um, let me get the easy part out of the way. Sam was perfect. 11 out of 10. No notes. I mean, not only was he written perfectly, the dialogue was perfect. The acting was also perfect. Sam was spot on. Frodo is a bit more complicated. Some people, which would include Christopher Tolkien, like to point out that movie Frodo was a teenager. Now, Frodo was 50 years old in the book, uh, at least at the part that he had left on his journey. Uh, this doesn't bother me personally so much because Frodo was 50, but his his aging had stopped when he was 33 years old and he uh, uh, obtained the One Ring. And that's the age that hobbits come of age. So him appearing to be, you know, like about 18 years old, it doesn't bother me. It's not such a crime. However, his demeanor is sort of not right. It's it's not terrible, but it's off. He's He doesn't come off as Mr. Baggins, Master of Bag End. He comes off as a kid. Um, his physical aging was indeed halting, halted by the One Ring, but he was 50 years old, and he was Mr. Baggins, Master of Bag End, and he had been so for around 17 years or so at the time that he had left on his journey. Now, it's it's possible, because it doesn't really seem in the films like 17 years passes between Bilbo's birthday party and Frodo leaving, and maybe, maybe it didn't. Maybe the time skip is just not there in the books. Maybe Frodo is 33 years old. He's still essentially a kid. But he's still off. It's, he's still not the Frodo described in the book. He, the Frodo in the book was brave. He stood up to the Nazgul. He invoked the name of Elbereth or Varda. And, he, and though he was not a mighty warrior like Aragorn or, or, or Boromir or even, or even Merry and Pippin later on, he was brave. He was not a football to be carried around by Arwen. Uh, in the book, it was Glorfindel. And Glorfindel didn't carry Frodo like that. He gave Frodo his horse and told him to flee. And then Frodo didn't flee. He stood his ground at the Ford of Bruinen, which is what allowed them to uh, sweep away all the Nazgul in the flood. So Frodo never, ever, and this is the real contentious part, in a million years, he would never tell Sam to go home. He would never send Sam away. He was well aware that Gollum was being deceptive. He had the attitude of, well, we know he's a liar, we know he's up to no good, but what other choice do we have? He's our best bet. And Sam agreed with this. Sam was keeping an eye on him, but there wasn't a, a, a sort of a hate triangle going on there. Uh, the films were excellent. The films are marvelous cinema, but when we do compare them to the books, there are issues that can crop up. There are differences, and some of the biggest ones are the way that certain characters came off different in a very fundamental way. Frodo was essentially robbed of his agency at many points in, in Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings, and he became more of a plot device than an actual character. Okay, moving on. Um, did Aragorn ever suspect that Boromir had any interest in taking possession of the One Ring? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think he did. And I'll tell you why, because um, Aragorn, you know, he seemed to find Boromir annoying. Uh, he was definitely over constantly having to correct Boromir's bad assumptions and his ignorant statements. I don't think, though, that there's any doubt that he trusted him, because he was a man of Gondor, he was a noble warrior. He, he might have been a bit of a pill, but he was a good guy. And... I don't think Aragorn sensed the change that came over Boromir after they left Lothlorien. The only character that noticed that Boromir had changed his attitude was actually Frodo. Um, Sam didn't even seem to pick up on it. And of course, uh, Galadriel had read his heart, but she didn't tell anybody else about about what, what he was up to or what he was thinking. If Aragorn suspected that Boromir was after the One Ring, that he had any interest in taking it, he would have kept a better eye on him. Uh, Boromir wouldn't have been able to slip off and follow Frodo, and nobody noticed it until Sam turned to speak to Boromir and, and saw that he was missing, and then they're like, wait, where is he? He was here a little while ago, and then they had to go looking for him. So I don't I don't think that Aragorn uh, suspected 
Boromir in that way. Okay, here's a question that came from Nathaniel Popa, who asks, Could an elite mortal warrior such as Aragorn, Isildur, Tuor, or Gimli defeat an Olughai armored Mordor troll? Oh, yeah, of course they could, yeah. You know who else could and did? Peregrine Took. Pippin. Um, I'm not trying to diminish Pippin and his accomplishments as a warrior, as a, as a knight of Gondor, but if he could defeat a troll... It's not difficult to imagine that Gimli could, and that Aragorn could, and that Isildur could. Uh, Tuor is so far beyond any of them because um, he's just he was he was the savior of men and elves. In some of the early versions of the Legendarium, in which Balrogs were considered, you know, something just slightly worse than trolls, they weren't as big of a threat, and there were a lot more of them. But Tuor slew five Balrogs in early versions of the story, the the Fall of Gondolin. Um, of course, this was changed. Tuor was the savior of men and elves, though, as I mentioned. A single Ologhai would be sword fodder to him. Now, before you lament that Tolkien was non-specific on whether or not the troll that Pippin slew was Ologhai, there's no indicator that the battle at Moronon took place at night. Uh, nor was there an indicator that Sauron cast a dark pallor over the battlefield as he had at Pelennor. Uh, while it is always kind of dark around the area, around Mordor, even any small bit of sunshine that came through um, would have killed normal trolls. The little bit of sunshine that came through at sunrise was enough to kill three trolls in The Hobbit instantly. Um, so that's why the Alagai were actually important, because sunlight doesn't harm them. Uh, aside from the actual sun, uh, regular trolls would be nothing it, to Gandalf. Gandalf was there, and he, he had what he called, he was a wielder of the flame of Anor, and Anor means the sun, which means that the light that Gandalf could emit is is just like the sun and could probably turn trolls to stone. So the Alaghai, they're very hardy warriors, but Middle-earth is a place where a single good strike could take out even the mightiest foes to ask Smaug or, or Glauron. Okay, next question. Uh, why did the ring allow itself to fall into the hands of Bilbo, who was a very moral person and hard to influence? Um, so the ring didn't specifically choose Bilbo. It chose, it chose not Gollum, if you understand me. The One Ring had been with Gollum for a really long time, and uh, there was no indication that Gollum was ever going to leave the little domain that he had under the mountains the One Ring has a way of rejecting someone, even beyond slipping away from them by changing its size. In The Hobbit, it was mentioned that Gollum wore the ring constantly until he couldn't bear to anymore, and then he kept it on him in, in a pocket close to his skin, but then it galled him. He then kept the ring in a little hidey hole on his little island on the lake, only wearing it when he needed to hunt for food. Now, this sort of process, we can see the One Ring distancing itself from Gollum. It did not wish to be with him. And we can see that though Gollum loved the ring, he also found, and he found it to be precious, he also hated it on some level. It galled him. He couldn't stand to wear it. He didn't want it against his skin all the time. Uh, we see a somewhat similar account in the book Unfinished Tales, where Isildur, who is traveling to the north to establish his reign in Arnor, also wished to bring the One Ring to Lord Elrond, stating that he not only had failed to master it, but that he could not bear the pain of touching it. The One Ring did not want to be with Isildur either, and it was actively fighting him. The One Ring did not wish to be with Bilbo, though he didn't wear it constantly it did try to slip from him and that's why he kept it on a chain uh, and used it when necessary usually to hide from his annoying relatives the timing of the ring finally abandoning Gollum is probably not coincidental but it wasn't specifically because Bilbo was there it was because the orcs had become all riled up and there was a lot of activity going on and Sauron was off stirring in Mirkwood, the ring likely wished to be found by an orc, by a goblin, and uh, but Bilbo just happened to be there, something which Tolkien also said was not a coincidence, but perhaps a bit of divine intervention. Now, I'm not saying that Iluvatar nudged Bilbo out his door to go out in, into the wild and on his, on his journey, but 
the contrivance of Bilbo being dropped by Dwaylin and then bumping his head and being unconscious and then groping around in the dark and he just happens to come across a ring and he just pops it into his pocket not even knowing what it is um that may have been the influence of Iluvatar not so much the one ring specifically okay Next question, did Eldarion have a longer life due to his elven mother? So to, to, to clear that up, Eldarion is the, the son of Aragorn and Arwen. Now, it is possible that Arwen's blood may have reinvigorated the line of Elros, uh, which was diminished over time. And Numenor, especially after the Numenorians took up Melkorism and ritual human sacrifice, I, I, I kind of, I tend to doubt it. Aragorn lived to be 210 years old, upon which time he willingly laid down his life, something which was somewhat traditional for old Numenorean kings. His ancestor Elros had done this at the age of 500. Aragorn stated that if he did not go willingly, death would come for him before too long. But for one who was 210 years old, before too long could be another 20 years. So, um, his natural lifespan was nearing its end, but he wanted to go out on his own terms and accept the gift of man. Eldarion lived to be at least 219 years old, um, as estimated based on letter 338, letter 338 in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. And I hope when they, re they're going to re-release this book with new letters, so I'm hoping that they're appended to the end so that when we refer to the, the letters by numbers, it doesn't get all jumbled by a new edition. Um, in letter uh, 338, Tolkien vaguely described the end of Eldarion's reign as being about 100 years after the death of his father, Aragorn. From this, we can see that Eldarion likely lived longer than his father. Whether this was due to his mother's blood or not is up for debate. It is possible but the Valar had come to see the extended life of the Numenorians as an error uh, because they had become increasingly unwilling to accept the gift of man and sought immortality, which led to their fall, although one could blame Morgoth for that as well. It, it may be, though, that the taint is gone. Aragorn willingly gave up his life, as did Arwen one year later, though he did note that it was a bitter gift to receive. Eldarion's end is not detailed. We don't know if he died of old age or if he laid down his life willingly or if he was slain. Uh, so we really don't know is what I'm trying to say. Okay, next question. Uh, and this one came in from Elizabeth McDougall, who asked, uh, was the Third Age Gondorian colony of Belphalos named after or in honor of the First Age Haven of Phallus, where Círdan was lord? Um, I, don't, I don't think it's likely that Gondor was thinking specifically of Phallus when they named Belphalos. Uh, Phallus comes from the root fal, which means foam, and it refers to a seashore. Uh, any place where the sea and the land meet and there's a, the, the water is hitting the land and you see foam, it, it wasn't the name of a specific country or region, but rather the entire eastern shore of Beleriand was referred to as the Phallus, which is like saying it's the coastline or the shore. For their part, Gondor preferred Sindarin names for just about anything. They even had their own dialect of Sindarin, which was called Gondor Sindarin. Belphalos may actually mean shore, shore, which isn't as uncommon in linguistics as you might think. The bell prefix was never glossed. We don't actually know what it means. It's not Cinderin. Uh, it's a, it comes from a pre-Numenorean element, uh, which means it, it was uh, native Manish dialects in the Southlands previous to any colonization from Numenor. So it may be the indigenous word for sure, as speculated in the preface to The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, mixed with the Sindarin word for sure, so you would get shore, shore, bel falas. Another alternate idea that was postulated in the Vinyar Tengwar 42 uh, speculated that bel may have referred to the region later named Dor in Enru. Uh, I'm sorry, Dor in Ernil. Let me get that right. Dor in Erno. So Belfalos refers to the shore in Bel. Now, these ideas are not actually mutually exclusive. Bel could have been the name of the region, and it could have also meant shore or coastline. 
Either way, the legends of the First Age were not readily available to men in the Third Age and would not be until Bilbo's translations were copied and disseminated throughout Middle-earth later on in the Fourth Age. Good question, though. And here is the final question. And look at this. We we went a little long because I had 18 questions and some of them I spoke on at length, but it looks like we're getting in under an hour. So uh, this question asks, how can an entity like Gandalf, be older than time itself. How is that possible? Is that possible in the real world? So it's definitely possible in Tolkien's world, and I will explain that. And it's even theoretically possible in the real world, though it's so unlikely as to be virtually impossible, which I'll also explain that as well. It it could be hard to wrap your mind around the concept of time having a start and anything existing before this start. Because, after all, a casual observer might point out how uh, how can something be before time if the very idea of before is dependent on an understanding of linear time. So the way that time works in Tolkien's Legendarian, defined in the book Morgoth's Ring, would be that it is the measurement of the life of Ea. Ea is the created world or, or the universe. Since the universe has a creator, a Luvatar, and a point of creation, the Ainu Lindale, which means music of the holy ones, we can say that time started with creation. This is why the place where Iluvatar and the Ainur dwelt previous to the creation is known as the Timeless Halls. This does not preclude the author, both in-universe and out-of-universe, from using time-specific language to refer to events prior to the creation. The first sentence of the Silmarillion contains the word first and the word before. But we have to be able to read and comprehend the legends, uh, so that's why that sort of language is used. As one of the Ainur, Alorin, who was later called Gandalf, existed before Ea, and therefore he is older than time. Even though time itself as a concept started with Ea, there was no count of time, even in, until the creation of the two trees of Valinor, which may some elves older than the count of time, but also the original elves existed before the awakening, slumbering in the earth, as as old as Ea itself. So in reality, we can say that time started once entropy started. The Big Bang Theory is the conception point uh, for the creation of the current universe. Some scientists have fancied that there might have been a universe before that. Uh, there might have been some sort of existence before the Big Bang. And I can't say whether that's true or it's it's not true. I'm hardly qualified for that. But if a being existed prior to the Big Bang, they would be older than time. The Big Bang is what is referred to as a singularity or an event that affects a permanent change. Understanding that, nothing prior to the singularity can have an effect on the events after it. So we can think of the time prior as before time. Now that's getting into a whole other level of discussion. It's a bit outside my wheelhouse. But if you want understanding of how a being can be from beyond time or outside of time or before time, that is the rationale one might imply. If one believes that the, the universe is intelligently designed, then the designer would have to have existed prior to the creation of the universe. So I hope that clears that up. I hope, uh, at least on the Tolkien end, and hopefully on the on the real life end as well. But if you made it all the way into this part of the video, you must have enjoyed it. So leave me a thumbs up. Leave me some comments. Recommend me to any like-minded friends you might have. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell and all that. And of course, send me some questions on Quora, and we'll see you guys next week. And we'll have the second part of my playthrough of the Lord of the Rings Volume 1 for the uh, Super NES coming up this weekend as well.